I was kidnapped by mimes. They did unspeakable things to me. Grab a jam, I swear. And it's a damn of my podcast. This guy's insane and brought to brain. It's just so esteemed here up. Schmack a gob, it's time for another Vieira Vault, and this time you heard me and Will talk about the ACDC Bond Scott years. Now we're going to go into the Brian Johnson uh, era with, hey, Will, Will hey. here to join me again. What's up, everybody? Good to have you back, Will, and another person joined us, uh, an ACDC aficionado, I would say, Edwin Canastracci. What's up with Edwin? Hey, thank you, Ralph. Great to be here. You know, love the show. You know, love to be part of a conversation about ACDC, if you and Will. It's going to be awesome. Excited. Right on. I watched, uh, I watched your videos. He's got a really cool YouTube channel. It's, it's just your name, right? Edwin Canastracci? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. It's nothing fancy. Just my name. There right. Long-ass Italian name. <laughs> but it's a cool channel. And he talked about the recent ACDC album, which I really dug that review. And I, I and I, what was it? That cheap trick thing you just did was awesome. Yeah, I did the and, countdown. Uh, I count. I did my my ranking. The ranking. For every, yeah. yeah, my ranking for every cheap trick album. Did that. My videos sometimes they tend to be long. So if you if you want to sit and watch a really long video with a guy pontificating for like an hour about old awesome rock and roll music then you might like my shit yeah i do <laughs> shit. Right. I, I look for long videos on youtube so i can either clean around the house or do shit around the house so i can have like some talk in the background if i'm not you know listening to music so yeah i i, I did a lot of cleaning during that cheap trick one <laughs> it's, 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 you can be productive during my videos you know i don't demand that you you know it could be in the background while you do some shit exactly edwin when did you discover ACDC. Uh, I was I probably the ideal age. I think I was like twelve years old, just entered junior high, and this was I believe nineteen the fall of nineteen eighty nine. I was a big Stephen King fan, and I had seen just seen the movie Maximum Overdrive. That mm. believe it or not, this is like a period like in the late eighties where ACDC wasn't quite everywhere like they were before and afterwards. Like there was a little period there, like when I was getting into junior high, it was before the big comeback with Razor's Edge. So I got in there like just literally a year before that comeback and maximum overdrive. Like that was the first time I heard any ACDC songs. Like as hard as that is to believe, like that's the first time I heard hell's bells and for those about to rock. And I was just starting to get into music. I had uh, my older brother was the guy, he was like a hair metal guy, and he got me into some shit like Dokken and Cinderella and stuff like that. But I was kind of grown away from that shit and wanted to kind of have my own kind of music. And ACDC, something about it immediately, just as part of the soundtrack, it just like hit me. And I immediately barred Who Made Who from this uh, kid in a shop class. That He was the only kid I knew that had ACDC patches. So I went like right to him. And I was like, hey, hook me up. And he gave me Who Made Who. I borrowed it. It was awesome. I think like two weeks later, I went to the mall with my allowance and I got Back in Black, Fly on the Wall and Dirty Deeds. I got all three of those on on cassette because all those songs, you know, were songs that were represented on Who Made Who. That's why I went there first. And I mean, the first cassette I popped in was Back in Black. And well, man, forget about it. That's it. It was like as soon as I heard that, it was even better then the compilation, which was essentially kind of like a best of. But, I mean, that was the first time I heard, like, Shoot to Thrill and, like, uh, Back in Black. And, you know, that's I never looked back. I, I became immediately obsessed with ACDC. It was, luckily, just, like, two months before Christmas. So I, like, got my parents to give me, like, a whole bunch of ACDC CDs. And, and I just... I just ravaged through their back catalog and they were, I kind of did something similar a few months prior with Aerosmith. So uh, ACDC though was like, they were the second band that I did the, the thing where you go back and start getting the back catalog. And they still to this day, they're one of my favorite bands and they hold a very special place in my heart. The Razor's Edge tour was the second concert I ever went to. And uh, you know, I love them. I love them deep, deep in my bones. 
It's funny because ACDC doesn't have a greatest hits, but there's two soundtracks that are basically greatest hits. Yeah, yeah, the, and the Iron Man too. And I noticed that they they made it a point to not put any of the songs you know that were on Who Made Who on Iron Man two. Interesting. So, yeah, so it's like they kind of see that as a kind of like if you want to have a greatest hits, it is kind of weird though. Well, what I, did you I, think of what did you think of Maximum Overdrive? Oh, I loved it. I, I, really? I still love it. Yeah, it, it's 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 a B grindhouse film, but it's like Stephen King was doing a lot of cocaine at the time, so it has a cokey kind of energy to it that I like. <laughs> okay. And even, even as a kid, and it had a badass Green Goblin truck. I remember. <laughs> I remember. Yeah, yeah and, I, I own that. I own that DVD. I, I I enjoyed the film. It was really bashed when it came out. I saw it in the theater back then. Wow. That, yeah, me too. Me too. We yeah, made so. you. We made you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, this was a great era, though. It's like, because uh, I was in junior high, so I was just like renting these movies, you know, for the first time. But that was the fun thing. You'd rent these horror movies with your buddies and you'd all watch them on Saturday night. And it was kind of like my getting into like horror movies on VHS co- coincided with me getting into like heavy metal and hard rock at the same time. So to me, it's it's linked, you know, in my head forever. Those those two yeah. things. I'm old as fuck, dude. When I was in junior high, we could, there wasn't no well, VHSs were like five million dollars. You know, you couldn't buy one, so you know we depended on HBO back then. But um, well, I I know I asked you in the last episode, but I forgot. When did you get into them? Um, you know, I it was right around the same time, kind of. Uh, Brian Johnson was definitely already in the band. Uh, I would say around. Uh, Flick of the switch era, maybe maybe fly on the wall, but uh, yeah, my brother, my older brother, uh, and my older sister, she was a fan of the Bon Scott era, so I was familiar with the uh, the early ACDC stuff, but I didn't really really get into them until about Flick of the Switch or or Fly on the Wall. My brother started bringing home the records, and I actually gravitated more to the Brian Johnson stuff first, and then I went back and got into the uh, Bon Scott stuff, but. Uh, Brian Johnson has a special place for me just because uh, just those albums seemed heavier at the time, at least. And I just really loved ACDC in the 80s. And uh, that, oh, yeah, that's when I got into them for sure. Yeah, uh, mine was uh, the live one, uh, If You Want Blood. Awesome. But uh, all right, we'll get into the first album now. I will say this because I was thinking about this on my ride home right now. What do ACDC back in, other than selling a quadrillion albums? ACDC Back in Black. What is ACDC Back in Black? Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction, and Def Leppard Hysteria have in common. You guys know this? They've, they've all gone diamonds. Well, I mean, yeah, the, other than them selling a lot. Here's the weird thing about these multi million dollar selling albums they all did not sell much when they first were released. Uh-huh. Yeah, they, it was a slow burn. Yeah, it wasn't until uh, MTV finally uh, decided to show Welcome to the Jungle. That exploded um, uh, Appetite. Uh, you Shook Me Not All Night Long exploded uh, Back in Black, which was released like like six months after the release. And Hysteria was Pour Some Sugar on Me because those were all like albums that didn't really sell. I remember vividly, dude, Back in Black played the West Palm Beach Auditorium, which was way too far for me. I wanted to go so bad. It was a 90-minute drive, which I didn't have a car back then. If I did, I would have seen that show. But then when it became big, they they started a petition on WSHE, the radio station, to get ACDC to play here when when Back in Black exploded. And even me that wanted ACDC so bad to come back, I was kind of pissed going, you all motherfuckers should have went to West Palm Beach Auditorium, you bitches. <laughs> you know, now that they're big, you want them here. And I'm sure West Palm Beach wasn't even fucking sold out. You know, it's it was ridiculous. But anyway, yeah. But you're, weird... you're right. Uh, uh, with Hysteria, uh, that's right. Their first single was uh, Women. Woman. And that song didn't do shit. Yeah. Uh, and Animal. That... Then Animal but... came afterward. Didn't do shit either. Right, then his, right. Actually, Hysteria was the third one. Uh, well, there you pour, go. Pour Some Sugar was actually the fourth video. And that's the one that exploded yeah. the album. You know, another album, not quite as, not the slow burn that Hysteria was. That's probably the slowest of them all. But uh, never mind, uh, Nirvana was a little bit of a slow burn. I remember oh, really? having that. 
Yeah, me and a, a few of my friends, we had that album about six months before it broke. Wow. Uh, smells, yes. It, the, fight, the first time I saw Smells Like Teen Spirit, the video was on Headbangers Ball. Yep, yep, and, yep. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that was a good few months. It was like kind of just thought of as like, hey, if you like Alice in Chains and Soundgarden and the Seattle Grunge stuff, here's Nirvana. And it was it didn't really cross over to like the pop market and general rock market until like maybe I don't know, it was a few months. I remember that because I, I remember being taken by surprise a bit like, oh, it smells like Teen Spirit's like a big hit now. Well, yeah, I can see it. It's a catchy song. But it, it, it was a couple months after it was already out. That's crazy, man. And, yeah. and that's another multi-million dollar album, uh, selling yeah. album. So it's weird how these like the biggest rock albums. They were kind of, I wouldn't go as far as say dud, but they didn't come out of the gate, you know? Sometimes really they need think, to sink in. Yeah. But anyway. Um, so right. one thing, Ralph, that you you went, you were at the, the For Those About to Rock tour, though, the Bell yes. Cannon. I did wow. get to see that show. That's amazing. Um, yeah. That was, was the first time you saw ACDC was, was For Those About to Rock? Yeah, the first time I saw them. And I'll never forget, man, that show started with Hell's Bells where the bell came down. And then Angus alone on stage with one spotlight on him. It was, oh, it was like finally I got to see ACDC, you know. And yeah. uh, it was a hell of a show. But um, back in black, I look, man, I respect anybody's opinions. But you two, I don't respect <laughs> both of you. Because both of you, I know both of you don't think back in black is the best album with Brian Johnson. And nope. This, nope. is where I, this is where I draw the line, man. <laughs> You're all wrong. Because uh, Bleeding Priest, <laughs> Will, I mean, um, you and Edwin share the favorite Brian Johnson album. Oh, okay. Don't get me wrong. I love it. And it's my second favorite. But, man, back in black, dude. Yes, if it, it suffers the burnout factor. But, God damn, there's not a weak track on this album. It's I just, totally agree. I totally agree. It's so good, man. Um, I, what can I say? I mean, and, you know, living in 1980, I mean, this was the year of, the for, for me, my favorite year of, of music. You know, everything that came out that year, Heaven and Hell, uh, well, On Through the Night. You British know, Steel. British Steel, The First Maiden, the yep. two killer Saxon albums, you know. Yep. And, this uh, I mean, I can go on and on and on. Ace with, of Spades. Ace of Spades. The Angel Unmasked. Witch. I mean, no, I was kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there's an exception to every rule. Um, <laughs> women and Children First. Yeah. I mean, come on. What a fucking year that was. And this one was probably the highest seller of, out of all of them. You know, in, you know, a year later or so. Um, you know what? Uh, well, I'll get into it. I hope I remember. Remind me about when we get to the, for those about to rock, say, Ralph, what did you want to say about this album? Because I might forget. Because I want to go through this album, and dude, there's just not a bad track on here. And I, let me look through this thing. You know, Hell's Bell, Truth the Trill, What Do You Do For Money, Give Me The Dog A Bone, uh, Let Me Put My Love Into You, Back In Black, You Shook Me All Night Long, Have A Drink On Me, Shake A Leg, Rock And Roll Ain't Noise Pollution. A lot of people would say, well, if you have to pick your least favorite would be a lot of people would probably say shake a leg. No you, way, dude. No I, fucking way. I, I that's the say, best. That's my favorite song on the album, man. No yeah. shit. Really? I, I will say shake wow. a leg has shake a leg has the best solo on the album. It is a great solo. I mean, it's heavy, song. man. It's, it's right. the heaviest song. I, think, I love man. I love that song. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's not, it's not my least favorite. Uh, my favorite would be have a drink on me. You know? That's my but second favorite. Yeah. That, that song is just, and I'm sorry, man. I don't buy the bullshit that Bond wrote these lyrics. I just don't buy it. You know, it's it's a conspiracy thing. If anything, have a drink on me would be it. Because these other songs don't sound like Bond lyrics. See, yeah. Bond, Bond, when he wrote lyrics about hell, it was about partying and having a good time. This one is, I'm going to get you, Satan get you, and if God's on the left and I'm sticking to the right. It's very evil. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, with Brian Johnson became very, very evil. Where Bond was more like a, you know, look at me, mama. I'm, I'm on a highway to hell, you know. It's party time, you know. Um, but, ah, you know, but it, it is hard. I mean, yeah, Have a Drink on Me is my favorite. But to, to say my least favorite would be really hard because I love them all. But I would have to be 
uh, one that a lot of people love, but I love it too. But I would say rock and roll ain't noise pollution, and I love it. Mine too. Mine too. It's your least favorite. How about you, Edwin? What's your favorite off here? My favorite? Uh, we we say like these days, like you know, this is always subject to change. I'm talking. Yeah, no, yeah. talking about now. Yeah, right now, right now. I gotta be honest. Uh, I'd say uh, let me uh, put my love into you. Maybe it doesn't, and I think partially because it doesn't have quite the same burnout factor as like most of the album. And but it has that thing. I, one thing, all most of my favorite ACDC songs, the ones that are like in the top ten. It's another reason why I love Powerage and for those so much is I like the darker songs, like when mm-hmm. they're kind of dark and sexy at the same time. And for those, and uh, let me put my love into you. It's like it comes in kind of creeping like, and it, it's like sensual but dark and kind of evil and sexy at the same time. It's just got a groove. It's got a swagger to it, and uh, just Brian's voice, everything, the guitar tone. Something about that song that that's a song I keep coming. And that's actually probably my second favorite Brian Johnson era ACDC song. Probably breaks probably my fifth favorite overall. I love this fucking song, and it's just so dirty. You know, <laughs> let me put my love every uh, dude. Every time I hear that song, it reminds me of when I was like 16 and I had a chick in my house, and we were playing back in black, and I'm making out with her in the couch. And when let mm-hmm. me put my love into you, I told her straight. I go, let me put my cock into you, girl. <laughs> and then she just grabbed me and started making out. And I started fucking her. I yeah, that's got the vibe. I used to. You're, I re- you're such remember. a romantic. You're such a romantic. <laughs> I thought this how it hey, hey, works. I noticed something about women though. It's like fine. I like I put on. I made out with a lot of women back in black in the background, and yeah. and it'd be all good until. Uh, the third song when uh, What Do You Do For Money Honey came on they'd always look at me like accusatory like what the fuck what's going on here <laughs> and, and be like you know I was like hey you know it's sexy it's rock and roll like this is sexist and they get all upset but this was like the 90s you know it was much harder trying to get laid in the 90s I reckon than back when you were doing it Ralph <laughs> yeah, yeah back when I was doing it like again What Do You Do For Money Honey that reminds me when I was a kid picking up hookers <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> when I was younger, that was probably I say that or shoot to thrill or uh, have a drink on me. Those three were probably like my three top ones. But it, it's more like in recent years that let me put my love into you is kind of crept in there as one of my favorites. But the the whole album's great, and you know, obviously a few like shoot to thrill, back and black, hell's bells. They're a little they're played out, but. When I listen to the album, you know, I listen to it all the way through. It's still like as they're played out. Some of those songs are played out by themselves. But as part of Back in Black, the album Back in Black, especially if I'm, you know, putting on the the vinyl, man, it's fucking, you know, per- perfection from first note to last note, you know, from oh, yeah, bell man. toll to the end, you know. So hey, speaking have, of the yeah. speaking of the bell toll. Can you tell the difference? Like, if you just hear the the beginning of the of Hell's Bells and just hear the bell alone, and then you hear "For Whom the Bell Tolls" by Metallica, can you tell the difference right away from one bell from the other? Uh, I kind of can. I yeah. can too. It's very slight, though. Yeah, and no, yeah, they do sound alike, but yeah, I can because the the it rings a little longer on Hell's Bells. You know? Well. As a percussionist drummer, do you know like like is there like a a, a t- like a, a tuning for the bells? Like is that a thing? No, it just it just depends on what you're using to hit it with. If you're using a metal like mallet, or you know a soft felt mallet, or just or something wood like a wood, wooden uh, stick of some sort. So yeah, it just depends on what you're hitting the bell with and the size of the bell as well. But when, when I'm ever, whenever I'm at a baseball game or a football game. Uh, you know, they play both of those songs in heavy rotation at uh, Giants games and uh, Niner games. And sometimes I get fooled. Like, like me and my friends will be sitting in the stands and we'll hear a bell and we, we start guessing, like, what is this going to be? Is it uh, for whom the bell tolls or, or back in black? And sometimes I get thrown off. You know, they're, they're very similar. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think in a setting like that, when you're in a stadium, you, yeah, it's hard to tell. But if you're mm-hmm. home. You know, you're home, you can, you can pretty much. And I will say, you know, out of all these songs, I say Have a Drink on Me is my favorite. But in a live setting, I think Shoot the Thrill translates the best live out of all these tunes. 
All right, speaking, not, speaking of a live setting, they never played a Shake a Leg live, I don't think, right? I don't think so. You you could be right. I don't. I think that may be. Oh no! Uh, probably let uh, let me put my love wasn't played live. Either. Yeah, I don't think right. they ever played that either. Those yeah, two, right. but I think everything else was played. I mean, right. not sure about what do you do for money, honey? But they did make a video for it, so that makes me think. Yeah, they probably did play that live. They, they did play that. I saw uh, there's clips of it in uh, Tokyo and the. Ah, uh, I have yeah. that show. And yeah, they also shot. they also did it at some show tr- at the show I was at. They did it the the stiff upper lip uh, tour. Oh, cool. right. Yeah, didn't they do it with Axl Rose as well? No, I don't, they, they did a they, they giving a dog, dog a, bone. a bone. Oh, that's yeah. it. Okay, and okay. they did have a drink on me with him as well. Yeah, right. they did. They did give it a dog bone. The one I was at the Brian Johnson leg of Rocker Bus. They did give it a dog bone at that one too. That was already part of the set list, which I totally freaked out when they did that. I wasn't expecting that. Cool. Uh, so, so let me ask you both, uh, Will first. Come on, man, don't disappoint me, bro. <laughs> Back in Black is your second favorite, at least, right? Oh yeah, of course. Of How course. about you, Edwin? Okay, this is the, it's. Con- I don't want to be all complicated here, but. This is where I make I make a division here. I objectively, if I was to objectively say what is the best album of Ron Johnson, yeah, objectively I'd say Back in Black. <clears throat> but but you know our taste and what we listen to and like isn't always objective, you know. And I mean sometimes it lines up, but sometimes it doesn't. And for those about to rock, it's it's my go to album of Ryan. and so that's it's become my favorite one of Brian and my second favorite. All, you know, overall, right after Powerage. The difference is Powerage has always been my favorite Bond since I first listened to it, and that has never stopped. Now, granted, Powerage does not have nearly the same burnout factor as Back in Black. So I do think that accounts for it. I think one of the, well, actually, probably the main reason that I always say for those about to rock these days is just because of the burnout factor of Back in Black. It's essentially for those about to rock, it's an album objectively I can hear is just. Almost as good as Back in Black, except yeah, for I, I haven't I, heard it as m- many fucking times. <laughs> I'll agree with you. I think it's almost as good as Back yeah. in Black. I but, will say that. So it, will... it, it's the closest album to Back in Black that's ever been, you know, created. <laughs> and and yet I haven't, you know, played because and it's not just the radio and and parties and bars and whatnot and TV commercials and what have you. I mean, myself, I played Back in Black like fucking crazy when I was a teenager. And for those, I didn't do it as much. So uh, I didn't gravitate to that album as much when I was younger for whatever reason. Uh, but then as I got older and Back in Black was a little you know, more burned out, I found myself going more and more back to For Those About to Rock until I just almost have become obsessed with that album. And I listened, to, I, you know, I just listened to it last night. You know, I'm always listening to For Those About the Rock recently. I, I listen to the, For Those About the Rock more than Back in Black. That I will say, but I just can't, dude, it's like, I don't know, man. Maybe if you both were there in 1980 when that shit was just like exploded everywhere, it was just, I don't know, it got into all our DNAs and we were just so enamored by, wow, what an amazing fucking album. And I don't remember no backlash of no Bond, no ACDC type thing. You know, it was a different world back then, too. You yeah, know, everybody didn't have the yeah, internet. Yeah, exactly. And everybody wasn't so fucking fickle. You know? So, and, so, uh, so yeah, you were an ACDC fan prior to the release of, of Back in Black, right? So Yeah, I bought Highway to Hell when it was new. So there was no apprehension whatsoever or you weren't skeptical no. at all? No, man. I, I don't know. And I, dude, I remember vividly being in junior high school when somebody came up to me and said Bond died. And it just like floored me. I was like, fuck. And you know, what's weird is what, what did it take? Three, four months after Bond's death for Back in Black to come out? It was pretty quick, man. It was quick. And, but back then, time was so slow. It didn't seem that quick. And people knocked you know? out records fast back then. Yeah, right. man. Right. And, and I was just blown away by it, man. I, I went out and bought it. Um, I don't remember hearing anything on the radio at the time. Uh, but I remember buying uh, Back in Black when it first came out and took it home. I, you know, I'm an ACDC fan. I love Bon Scott. And let me see what this dude can do. And when I heard it, I was like, this is great. This is awesome. I don't like it as much as the Bond stuff because of timeline. I was... 
That was the first thing I bought. And I still think Bond is the greatest lyricist ever, one of the greatest front men ever. You know, if there's anybody I would want to see live that I didn't get to is Bond. That would be the top of my list. Then Zeppelin, you know. Uh, I would like to see, you know, I, and I don't know, maybe I, I, I think I, I may like Led Zeppelin a little more than ACDC with Bond, but I, I still would pick Bond to see live, you know, and, but then it would be Led Zeppelin. But there's just something about Back in Black that to me is like so historic and such a monument, you know, to, to, rock, to heavy rock. Well, 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 when I was a kid, Back in Black was a heavy metal album. Sure. You know, before yeah. it became diluted and everybody's like, it's hard. yeah, and looking back on it now, yeah, it's not really metal. I mean, Hell's Bells is kind of metal, though. I, can, I, I think it, but when, even when I got into them, like things changed a lot in the 90s when everyone got obsessed with the categories and shit. But I got to say, P- ACDC was only, it was only headbangers listening to it. Yeah. Metal. Oh no! It, it wasn't until after the Razor's Edge that everyone started listening to ACDC. At least, you know, from what I saw. Yeah, well, there was like I say around the time Who Made Who, um, there was a lot of jocks into ACDC. I noticed back then mm. they became kind of pop, but then it, it dipped a bit till Razor's Edge. But there was a, a moment there in the eighties where you know you shook me all night long was so accessible. And uh, there were a lot of jocks going. My favorite band's ACDC, and then Mister Mister. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I remember like 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 the the guy who gave me the Who Made Who. He was like he was like a punk rocker, but he loved thrash and ACDC too. And he would have like I remember like Overkill and like Metallica patches. But he had an ACDC patch too. So it was like it wasn't like they were seen. Like they worked with metal. At least that's how they, it was. they were. They were totally accepted across the board with. Uh... With all, all kinds of styles, even people yeah. that were into like, you know, shitty bands like Poison and stuff were also ACDC fans. Yeah, yeah. like you said, and people who were into Slayer loved ACDC as well. I mean, they were pretty universal in that that way, you know. Yeah, punk rockers liked them too. Like, right, they, they were kind of across the board. Well, there was there was a short when ACDC first uh, invaded England around. I think that was either Let There Be Rock or Power Rock. They were labeled a punk rock band. Yeah, I remember, I, I remember seeing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and, and, and you guys know the movie Over the Edge. Yeah. Oh Love yeah, it. of course. Remember? Cheap trick. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, remember the, the the Power Age poster? He had yeah. His, that should <laughs> oh, look yeah. punk rock. I that, should look, that should look punk rock to me. It, you know, totally. That poster. It looks like it could have been a punk rock band. You know. Totally. The image, you know, kind of looked punk rock, snotty punk rock. You know. But um, all right, so. We Just all what? agree ACDC rule. I mean, at Back in Black rules, right? Oh, of course. Totally. Of course. All right. So we'll to go to, Back in Black. We'll go to the next one. And this is, this is what I wanted to bring up about for those about to rock. I'll, you know, um, Quiet Riot, Metal Health, uh, g- gets all the praise for being the first metal album to hit number one. But mm-hmm. for those about to rock, hit number one. And it stayed there for three weeks. And not a lot of people talk about that. And if you ask me, man, that's the first, you know, and it was still metal at the time, was labeled metal. So ACDC, I think, were the first metal band or back then hard rock band. Because, dude, honestly, for those about to rock, you know, inject the venom, bang your head. Come on. They're both metal. You know what totally. I, mean? I, I totally agree with you. I just think the only difference was, ACDC didn't consider themselves a metal band, and Quiet Riot did. Yeah, and, but yeah, Quiet Riot. In, in reality, they were barely a metal band, dude. I mean, yeah. they were barely crossing that line. Uh, right. And I agree. I would. I think uh, for those about to rock, is just as heavy or heavier than. I think. Uh, I uh, think it's heavier. I do yeah. think. I think it's heavier as well. I think it's yeah. a heavier album. You know. Yeah. And uh, definitely and meatier and darker. But you know, I'm gonna let I'm gonna say what I feel about U 2s favorite ACDC album after uh, you two talk about it. So you go first, Edwin. Hey, it's, this album, like this, we talk about slow burn. I don't. I mean, immediately there were a few songs I loved about this album when I got it. It was you know, Evil Walks and a few of the songs I did not really get into, but. This was not one of the ones that I listened to again and again and again obsessively when I first got into ACDC. Like I said, this has happened kind of over the years. And 
it's probably because, like I said, Back in Black was burned out. So naturally, I guess I kind of wanted to go to an album that had a very similar production. You know, it's Mutt Lang fucking still in the box. The band's right there. Brian's fucking top of his game, singing the way he does on Back. And the songs are, if anything, this is one thing I think it does have an edge on uh, Back in Black. is It's darker and kind of meaner. And... I like, but yet in a weird way, kind of poppier, and it's weird that it's kind of dark and poppy at the same time. Like the songs are very melodic and very catchy. You can hear that this is Mutt Lang kind of also doing like when he's producing De- the Def Leppard stuff, and he's bringing that a bit to ACDC. But at the same time, it's just kind of mean and dark. I mean, like Inject the Venom, like that's just such a mean, badass song. Mm-hmm. And Brian, he's fucking on a whole other level when he's singing that this is like fucking uh, maybe like robert plan a bit on physical graffiti but that's about it i mean he's doing some of the best i don't care if you want to call it heavy metal hard rock rock and roll whatever he's doing some of the craziest next level vocals on that song and throughout you know put the fi- i mean it just warms up in the beginning with one of the greatest anthems ever i love the whole slow build up you know, beginning for those about to rock. Uh, like you, Ralph, I always get a little choked up, you know, when it kicks in, the, temp, you know, temp, the tempo picks up at, towards the end. Oh, you heard what I said about that. Oh, right? yeah, I've heard about that. I'll, I'll talk <laughs> about it when we, when we get it, it's, it's very righteous. It's very moving. It makes you feel like you're part of something. And then, you know, uh, put the finger on you, man. That's a, such bad. I, I love uh, those early Def Leppard records. You know, High and Dry is one of my favorite albums. But put the finger on you is like high and dry next level. It's like so rocking and catchy and it just makes you want to punch people. And, <laughs> and, 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 you know, I actually think one of the weaker songs, but still fucking great, is uh, the single uh, Let's uh, Get It Up. Oh, I love it's that catchy. One. Oh, don't get me wrong. I love it. I just think it's it's kind of like them doing like a Rolling Stones type song. But it's great. And I love the Stones. It's a catchy little funky song. But... Then, then they get into Jack the Venom, and that's like, oh, fuck, man. That's like one of the most badass tunes ever, and that's definitely like a top 10 ACDC yeah, song for me. It's probably my favorite off it. It's, it's probably my third favorite. That's how awesome this album is, and then Jack the Venom is like my third favorite song. I don't know. And then Snowball, it's great, upbeat track. Evil Walks, that's probably yeah. my second favorite. So, I mean, Ripping. yeah, it's like Hell's Bell Part 2, but fucking I'll take it. I'll take a Hell's Bell a hell's bells that hasn't been played to death you know it's fucking awesome and it's so catchy and then uh that breakdown and it's creeping cod yeah Man, i don't why, why weren't evil walks and cod singles i don't know they should have released more singles from this album i think cod is so goddamn catchy care of the devil really clever lyrics i really like the lyrics to that song really fun and nasty i know most people and i think you're uh, one of them, Ralph. A lot of people think it kind of dips off after that. Yeah. And I used to think that myself. But in recent years, you know, uh, I, I have grown to like the the, uh, the break in the rules. It's, it's, it's creeping. I, love, I always love when Angus does that little finger tapping stuff. And it's got this cool groove. And then uh, Night of the Long Nights is just kind of rowdy and fun. It's like a sing-along blokes at a pub getting a little too rowdy and then do something bad kind of song i don't know i like it and and this is uh you know we might have issues about this uh but my very favorite brian johnson acdc song and my fourth favorite acdc song period is the last track spellbound spellbound i think is this dark majestic masterpiece i love that song you know he's putting his hand in the fire Man, that groove, that riff, it's just dark and mean. The only songs I put ahead of it are like three songs from Powerage, you know. Uh, but Spellbound's my favorite Brian Johnson era ACDC song. I love that song. To me, it's, it's, it rivals, I mean, I, I put it, it's, I think it's their best closure, uh, closing number. And don't get me wrong, I love Night Prowler and, and Whole Lot Rosie. Kicked in the but, teeth. Yeah, I kicked it if I put I I I'd put I I'd put Night Prowler, Whole Lot Rosie, and this song ahead of that. But then Kick the Teeth would be in the top five. Uh but yeah, this this is my favorite ACDC closing song. There's just something really dark and magical about it. This whole album, it has an almost kind of un very unlike them for the most part. It has a little bit of a Sabbath vibe 
there's something kind of dark and mad like black magical about it you know there's just a vibe to it that's a little different like you had a little bit of that with hell's bells but now like it's like a whole album of hell's bells uh i fucking love it so that's why i gotta uh, say those about to rock uh, how about you will talk about your favorite acdc album i would buy um I, the first thing that well okay I, I agree that it was a slow burn for me as well uh i didn't get into this album until years later like uh in, in like the early 2000s actually i mean i was always a fan of it but I never really tripped on how brilliant it was until, yeah, like I would say like 20 years ago or something. And uh, the thing that really uh, jumped out at me that made it different than Back in Black was uh, the sequencing of songs and how there's there's no gap or there's barely any gap between every song. You're right. Every song yeah. just starts yeah. right up after the, the last one ends. So yeah. it's very, very uh, relentless and pummeling in that aspect. And when you listen to the album from cover to cover, it's just like they're they're fucking you up, man. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's no moment to, to breathe or or chill. So that's what really uh, appealed to me when I finally like grasped the album. I was like, damn, this is a masterpiece. Um, uh, and uh, breaking all the rules is my favorite Brian Johnson ACDC song. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's I I love it, man. It just. Um, it just has a, a magic to it, and it's just like a fuck you attitude to the song, and uh, I love the solos on it, the bluesy vibe to it. And I'm not really much of a blues guy, but uh, it just, they do it right, man. And actually, Spellbound is my, my least favorite song on the album. <laughs> yeah, I, it's just something about that song. I don't know why. We all have our things. Although, I do love Breaking the Rules, too. Breaking the Rules yeah. is probably my... No, I wouldn't say. I say uh, let's get it up. Is probably my my least favorite, but breaking the rules wouldn't be one of my favorite ones. But I do love it. I mean, I love every song on this album. So me too, me too. Um, <laughs> and like like especially finger I knew like the way it just starts up right after this epic epic opening track, and it goes right into finger finger on you. Uh, and on this album, it seemed like Angus was embracing the tapping a lot more. Like that was becoming more of a a key. Uh, element in ACDC's music. I mean, I they, think they, I, I think it started with "Shoot the Thrill," right? Is that the that's first it started with "Shoot that? the Thrill," totally. But yeah. that's the only, only song on Back in Black with that tapping thing, right? Right. So, oh yeah, yeah. He definitely. It's definitely throughout this album much more. He definitely oh. like yeah is using it much more as a big as a part of their sound. Like this is now part of ACDC's sound in a very big way. And, and they they fucking took the ball and ran with it on follow up albums. You know, like that was definitely a, a major part of ACDC songwriting. Um, I also love COD because it's very crafty songwriting. Um, you know, to to like a a passerby or like someone who's not an ACDC fan or not a rock fan, and they hear that song, they might just think it's just some generic rock tune, like you know, like a, a by the numbers type of book, but. But type, by a numbers type of song, but it, it, it's really crafty. Like there's there's two different choruses. Like like early it's C O D, and by the end of the song it's C O D. I just love those little details. Yeah, like, they yeah. Really took took some time into these songs. You could tell it wasn't a rushed album, and they were taking it fucking seriously. You know, and and like you know it's following up back in black, so they had a lot to to prove and. Yeah, I just think they they hit a home run and they outdid Back in Black with this album, man. And like like everything uh, you said, it's just, it's heavier, darker. Uh, it does have kind of a Sabbathy vibe to it here and there. The lyrics are mean, um, and they involve a lot of black magic con like references and you know, I wonder where you hide your broom and all that stuff. Like I just, I yeah, I love it, man. I fucking love it. Great album cover and the album cover also, you know started a, a great uh, a tradition for ACDC with the with the you know the cannons on stage you know so uh i yeah it's fucking awesome it's it's my favorite album cover uh actually from them there's just something about that cannon on the gold and the black yeah. writing it just looks so badass so simple i mean i love all the early 80s album covers for because they're all so simple i like the sim simplicity of it but this one you can't get a cooler album cover. You love the album cover for uh, Dirty Deeds? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I wasn't counting that because actually that that that's 
the, the American release is 81, but that they did have that cover for the international release in 76. Uh, no, no. Uh, uh yeah, I think yeah, it was 76. Yeah, 76. What's the what's the cover for uh... With Bond? With Bond. No, no, the Bond other too. but I think are you referring to the original Australian one or the one that Hypnosis did uh the the international American the new wave looking one. Yeah, that yeah, this, Oh, that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know, that was done by the the company that did all like the Pink Floyd stuff and a lot of progressive rock stuff. Right. And right. I, I used to think it looked new wavy too, but apparently it's it's prog rock because <laughs> it because they did that in '77. It was that company, but right. maybe it was like proto new wave. But yeah, that's why it looks so weird. They hired uh, Hypnosis. They also Hypnosis did um they did yeah, a couple they, yeah they and Zeppelin they did a couple of Zeppelin's big ones. Yep. They, Houses of the Holy and Presence. Yeah. So I mean, it's great. It's a wonderful album cover what they did, but it's just not an ACDC album cover. Right. Yeah. Well, um, I love this album. I really do. Uh, I just like Back in Black more. It was my first tour. Unfortunately, they played Inject the Venom early in the tour and scrapped it by the time I saw them. Oh, so, wow. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, it was early in the tour. I read that up. Uh, and I believe COD, too, was yeah, also but, played live, but not at the show I saw. So, yeah, they scrapped uh, when, when you saw early. them. When you saw them, what songs did they play from the album? As far as I remember, the first three tracks. That's it. Okay. Uh, put the finger on you. Let's get it up. And for those about to rock. Now, I'll talk about for those about to rock because Edwin touched upon it. You know, first I got to say, I always liked for those about to rock. Today, I love for those about to rock. Back in the day, I never hated it. I thought it was a cool song. And then I remember reading an interview with Gene Simmons where they asked him, what's the greatest song ever written? And he said, for those about to rock. And I was like, you're crazy, man. How could that be the great? You know, and I think that kind of like, like spoiled the song for me a little bit, <laughs> you know? And then uh, this happened, like, I, I think like 10 years ago. <laughs> and you're going to laugh, Will. Edwin knows this story. I'm listening for those about to rock one day. I'm actually watching the video, the, the live video. And when they go, when they go into the part where we salute, and then they, ramp it up with yo and it starts going i swear to god will i'm not lying i cried like a bitch <laughs> <laughs> i started crying because it was so good and i was like oh my god it's, it moved me to tears this song out of any song can you believe it i started crying because <laughs> for those about to rock when it amped up and that's when i realized this song is special man maybe I can't believe has the point I can't believe Gene Simmons actually said something that cool. <laughs> yeah, he actually, this was way back then, too. Like around 84, 85, I remember reading that. And wow. saying that it's the greatest song ever written. I was like, really? That one? You know, not fucking, uh, you know, uh, anything off Power Age, you know, Riff Raff, you know, something. But, but now in retrospect, it's like, I don't, I still don't agree with them. But at the same time, dude, I, I, I love that title track. So much, and, and also it's a pretty ballsy move after selling you know millions of copies of your previous album, opening up the next album with uh, how long is that song like six minutes long? Or? Yeah, yeah, it's it's almost six minutes, almost that's a pretty ballsy move, yeah, 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 and and it's kind of like you know, not fast for most of it, right? But man, and that was all over the radio back then. I remember Let's Get It Up. It was all over the radio back then, too. Me, too, dude. I totally remember uh, hanging out at Round Table Pizza, playing video games, and, and, and hearing Let's Get It Up uh, over the PA all the time, man. It was cool hearing that song on the radio. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. It's a it's better just, time. <laughs> yeah, I oh, love yeah. this album, man, but like you know, I said before, and I'll say it again. Both of you, uh, you know, your favorite songs, this is where I think after COD – it went downhill for me. I couldn't get into the last three songs. But listening to you guys talk so much about it, I'm like, eh, maybe I should go listen to that again, you know? I mean, I did listen to For Those About to Rock not too long ago, and I do play it in its entirety. But, man, for me, it's like right up to COD. It's like, God, this is so perfect. And then it just, like, dips for me. Now, the last three songs, I can't say they suck. I don't think they're horrible songs. I don't. I just think don't don't think they're strong as the first seven tracks, but that's me. And I'm kind of retarded. So, yeah, I was, I, was so I mean, shocked. I don't know. Too, I don't know any other 
ACDC fan that praises uh, breaking the rules all that much. You know, like uh, yeah. most people would agree with you. I don't know why that song speaks to me for some reason. I, I, I grew up being a major troublemaker. So maybe like those lyrics just you know <laughs> this speaks to me, man. I love it. Right. <laughs> no, I, I got that song's growing a lot on me. Like I say, even though this is how much I love the album, even though it's not one of my favorite songs from the album, I do I have grown to love that song, Will. And there's something about it. Yeah, it's it's got that like I don't know, and Brian, especially with his singing and the lyrics, and I do I think, yeah, he's no bond. But I do think Brian Johnson's underrated. I prefer his lyrics to the ones when the Young Brothers take over uh, in the 90s. Uh -huh. uh, because Brian, he might not have been as clever or as witty or as personal as Bond was. But he does have this working class, like, scrappy edge to the lyrics. And that's like a song that really exemplifies that. Because there's just something about it. You can picture Brian with his flat cap hanging out some, like, shitty little dive pub in, in Newcastle. You know, and causing some trouble. You know, it's just got that vibe to it. It's got that swagger and attitude. It's not just that they're saying breaking the rules. Like it's in the music. It's in the singing. It's sure. in the vibe. Totally get it. Well, I'll I'll, I'll go into the next one, uh, which is the best time I saw him with Brian Johnson with this tour, uh, Flick of the Switch. This is an album that, boy. I went out and bought it and loved it, and everybody I knew were like, ah, that album sucks. I was like, what? <laughs> now, I will say this, and this is going to sound weird, but let me explain. I, uh, You know, the last album, I didn't like the last three songs. There's not a song I dislike on Flick of the Switch, but there's not a song on Flick of the Switch as strong as the seven tracks I like on, on uh, For Those About Rock. I complete, completely agree. So that's why I would give the edge to for those about to rock with the strength of those songs I love. But this song, this album, now this album too, this is one of those albums that it didn't do that well, but it's a kick ass album. So, of course, you're going to get a large amount of people going, that's their best album. Because, you know, it kicks ass and it wasn't that popular. A lot of people love to, you know, praise the underdog album. And I do feel like this is an underdog album. Um, and this tour was phenomenal. Dude, it was insane. This this show was this show opened with a guitar solo. You know? That's how it fucking opened. Hang is just going ape shit on top of an amp, doing a crazy solo for like five minutes. Yeah, uh uh they showed this uh tour on MTV back in yes, the day. St. Louis. Yeah, and yeah, the, the show opens up with him just going just playing chords actually. Yeah. He's not even not even really soloing that. He eventually starts soloing, but at first he's just going, man, man, let's do yeah. chords and stuff. It's really cool, man. Yeah, it was, and it was just, dude, that show was wicked. I mean, it was a, because I love, for those about the rock show, it was so fucking killer. And then when I went to this one, I was like, I can't believe that was even better. I mean, it was fucking pummeling. It was a really insane show. And man, um, Rise in Power, House on Fire. The f fucking title track is so good. And I love Nerd Shakedown. Uh, Landslide is badass. N uh, Guns for Hire is what they open up. Deep in a Hole for me, it's kind of like the dark horse on this album. I love the fuck out of that song. Bedlam in Belgium is fun. Badlands, Brain Shake. I love it all, man. What do you think, Will? You know, the, the, I just... I could never really get into this album, man. I mean, I, 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 I like it, and, you know, it's, it's definitely better than later uh, ACDC albums, but it's so subpar compared to the first two Brian Johnson albums, uh, mainly because the drums just sound like shit on this record, I think. And I think the drum performance is really uninspired. And uh, it, I, just the fills uh, that uh, Phil Rudd's doing, just the da, da, da. I mean, just... There's no imagination whatsoever. And, you know, some people could say, well, he played like that on all the other albums, but that's not true. There was a, there was fire in his drumming on every previous album. And even though like there's hardly any fills, but when he did do a fill, it made sense. It was perfectly placed and it, it, it complemented the song. And just some of the drum fills on this album just seem like he's just going through the motions or not even trying I mean, it doesn't surprise me that he left the band shortly after. It just seemed like he was already, his head wasn't even there for the recording. That's what it sounds like to me. So being a drummer, uh, it's a, definitely a biased opinion. 
And I just think the drums are so lackluster on this record. And they, they're produced way too dry. I know they were trying to go back to their to the basics on this album. I remember like in Circus Magazine and Hip Parader at the time, that's how they were touting the album was they're going back to their roots, you know. So it definitely has that stripped down dry sound, but it doesn't work to their advantage. And I think it, it, it takes away from the album. And as far as the songs, I think the songs are really, really killer uh, for the most part. But uh, it was just the weak drums of the shitty album cover. I don't like the album cover either. So uh, I, it's, it's, one of, it's probably my least, well, I won't say that. I won't say it's my least favorite 80s album, but it's not nearly as good as uh, the two previous. Not well, nearly as good. Well, let me ask you, without naming the album, is there an album you like more than this album that comes later? Oh uh, yes. Okay. Yes. I don't. I think that I think every album after this one is not as good. Though I love some albums coming up, but I think this is the album that I don't think has ever been top since. Edwin. I I used to think that until recently. Uh, but yeah, the, this was I considered like the last great one. Uh, yeah. I mean, I I get. This was another slow burn when I this was when I got into when I first got into the back catalog, got all the ACDC albums. This was like the last one I got. In fact, I don't I don't think I got this one until after uh, the Razor's Edge was out until after that tour. And I got the cassette and uh, I got the cassette at the same time I got Powerage for the first time. Those were the only two that I didn't have at that point. And I got those two and immediately became all about Powerage. Like, as long as the first time I heard Powerage, I mean, Sin City, the first time I heard it live was live. It became my instantly my favorite ACDC song. Still my favorite ACDC song. You posted it today, Ralph. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's my favorite ACDC song. Nice. So so Powerage, like, became a revelation to me. And so Flick of the Switch, poor Flick of the Switch, just got kind of overshadowed by Powerage. And I remember... I think it also did a disservice that I was listening to it on a, a it was like a shitty cassette, you know, and it wasn't until like the early 2000s when the remasters came out that I reappraised it. You know, I thought it was like, eh, you know, there's I liked a few songs like I liked Guns for Hire. I could hear that was a catchy song and like Nervous Shakedown. There's a few songs that I was like, these are catchy songs. But overall, I didn't think it was as good as the other albums from the eighties. Like, I didn't even think it was as good as like "Blow Up Your Video." I yeah. didn't think th- I didn't think the songs were that good. You know, my opinions might be different now. But it, when I listened to the remasters in the early two thousands, like suddenly it was beefier. I had the CD remaster, and this is even better. You know, on vinyl a couple years after that. But the it brought out the bass and the groove and. And I understood it was like, it's a simple album, you know, intentionally, like Will was saying, it's a stripped down back to basics album, but man, it just has a fucking groove and it just suddenly clicked for me, you know? So, and then it became for a period, I liked it even more than for those about the rock. Like it became like my, yeah, for a period there, it was like, I became obsessed with flick of the switch for a few years and i was just like this is like just it's like if there's just one song like imagine if back in black was just the song back in black and it went on for like 30 something minutes and it just kept kicking your ass you know that's what it was all mid-tempo with the exception exception of like landslide you know it's all mid-tempo for the most part but man it's just got that groove and it's just and brian like every song he's singing he's screaming his head off like at the top and this is the last time you hear peak early 80s brian in all his glory and he's just screaming from first note to last note all the way through and it's savage and it's primal and i still love this album i'm not as obsessed about it as i was like in the mid 2000s but it and i admit that the songs aren't as strong as the the first two with Brian and not some subsequent ones. But man, you know, ultimately ACDC, hey, I love a good song, but it's also, but it's mainly about the groove and the heaviness. And this is a heavy album. It's got a groove and I still love it. It's still one of my favorite. It's probably, yeah, it's my fourth favorite Brian. It's an amazing album. I fucking love it. Do, do you think there's a, a, a slight noticeable difference in his voice though from... For those about to rock to, to this album, I, I can hear it. It's 
not quite as uh, full sounding or not quite as visceral. Yeah, it's or, not. As- it's not as diverse, and yeah, he has a little less personality in it, I guess, a little mm-hmm. bit. It just sounds like he's screaming a lot, but I feel like that's because I think like that was the thing, like, like we're going to see how heavy we can get. You know, it's ACDC kind of plays down the heavy metal thing, you know, actually mm-hmm. kind of always did. But I swear, it seems like with this album, they were trying to challenge the heavy metal. Like, they were going like hey twisted sister quiet right like we're heavier than you motherfuckers that that's what it seemed like they were doing with this album and i feel like brian intentionally was just going more for the screaming thing that that's the vibe i got get when i listen to this it sounds like they're just trying to show up the other heavy metal bands at the time i mean the, you know. the video for flick of the switch is one, probably my favorite acdc video like when they're just jamming in the, the practice space or whatever yeah, I love it. It's Angus is not even wearing the uniform. It's great. Yeah, and his guitar gets unplugged halfway through the song. You know? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I mean, part of me, listen, I love the schoolboy uniform, and, but I'm just telling you, I'm mainly about the music. Ultimately, if they had decided at that point to like give it up and Angus was just there with just regular jean shorts and like a t shirt, wouldn't have bothered me. To me, the, the presentation is for like the casual fans, you know? To totally. me, yeah, you know, fucking Angus doesn't need to wear a fucking uniform for me. I would have been just fine if they kept on looking like that. You, you know? know, they they also performed Nervous Shakedown that same video session, which I didn't see that video till years later. But it was still they they filmed that uh, flick of the switch and Nervous Breakdown. And cool, man. Yeah, it's it's really awesome. All right, the next one, Flying the Wall. Now I'll be on. This is the first time where I, I bought an ACDC album, and I was like, oh. I was so disappointed. Now, I had kind of a, a warning because I saw the video, the world premiere video on, a, on MTV for Danger. Mm-hmm. And I was like, and, you know, people say all ACDC sounds alike. This this song doesn't sound like ACDC to me. It's weird. It's yeah. And I, I was like, oh, I don't like this song. But it's ACDC. I'll buy the album. And when I bought the album, man, I'll tell you right now, man. Shake Your Foundation, Sink the Pink, Playing with Girls, and Sent for the Man to an Extent are the only songs I like off this. That's what you I You don't feel. like the title track? Man. Wow. <laughs> no, not really, man. Oh, man, what a strong opening track, man. Uh, I'll, I'll let you finish. <laughs> well, no, that's it. And I saw the tour. It was great. ACDC was always great, though. So, so well, lot, tour, lot. It, was, it, it was Ingve Momstein, right? It was Rising yes. Force. Yeah. Yes, which which is weird because Doesn't make I, any saw, sense. I saw Ingve Malmsteen open. And, oh, you know where I saw this, Will? In uh, LA, uh, LA Forum. I, I was in LA when I saw this show. Wait, uh, so was this pre or post Night Stalker? Uh, it, I think it was maybe around the same time. Yeah, because they were on tour when he was killing people. Yeah, it may have been at the same time. But yeah, and what was weird was, uh, what was what was first? I'm trying to think. Yeah, I saw this tour. This was the marching out tour with Ingve, but it was, um, oh, what's the guy's name on Trilogy? Mark Bowles was the singer. It wasn't Jeff Scott Soto. Oh, he didn't do the tour, huh? No. Then the next year, I saw Ingve open for Iron Maiden somewhere in the time tour with on the Trilogy lineup, and it was Jeff Scott Soto. <laughs> Ain't that weird? That's weird. (laughs) I talked to Jeff Scott Soto about it. He actually remembered that Hollywood Sportatorium show. Oh, man, I remember that because his family was here and shit. But, yeah, dude, I mean, it was a great tour. Can't remember who opened. uh, The flick of the switch was Fastway on their first album, which was awesome. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was amazing. awesome. That was amazing. I can't remember for the life of me. Oh, yeah, it was Yngwie Malmsteen um, who opened. I'm thinking of Blow Up Your Video. I can't remember who opened for that one. It was a oh, song. that was a uh, dude, dude. Okay, who made who was Queensryche, at least on the West Coast, and blow up your video. I want to say it was Cinderella, not the one I saw. I'm or thinking, Dawkin. I'm Dawkin thinking Dogs of Lamar. Uh, I think I know Dawkin did who, some of the Who Made Who, maybe blow up your video too. Uh, yeah, I know George Lynch and Don Dawkin got into a fist fight. Outside one of the ACDC shows, I don't know which tour. <laughs> I know that, but uh, yeah, I'm not a fan. What do you think, Edwin? 
Uh, Fly? Oh, no, yeah. I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm with Will here. I love Fly on the Wall. And that fucking title track? I mean, you didn't even like it live? Because didn't they open the shows with Fly on the Wall? I, I, drank, a lot of, I drank a lot of Jack Daniels back then. I don't remember when they played this song. I, I mean, <laughs> it, it, might, it might also be Timeline. Like, one thing, like, Fly on the Wall, if we don't count who made who, Fly on the Wall is like the second ACDC album I listened to right after Back in Black. And yeah, even then, even as a dumb you know, preteen in junior high, I knew it wasn't as great as, you know, black, back in black, but it's still like, Will. uh, it, it took me a little bit. It took me a few months before it, it took me. I had to like, listen to highway to hell and let there be rock before I really got into the Bon Scott stuff, dirty deeds, even though I did love it immediately. I didn't love it as much as fly on the wall actually at the time. And, uh, well, actually may, maybe even, I got to admit, probably even now, not obviously the songs are better in Dirty Deeds and Fly on a Wall, though. It's got this heaviness to it. Uh, um, Mm -hmm. Kind of different from Flick. Like Flick's heavy, but Flick is like concentrated kind of heaviness where Fly is like a wall of heaviness. Wow. Yeah, it's loud. And it's uh, it's just to me immediately, as soon as you hit those chords, you know, Fly on a Wall, it just sounds like a fight it sounds like a fight on a hot summer night you know and it's just got this vibe it's it, it's it, more australian sounding than american i feel like if it feels even the, the album cover there's something to it that seems a little maybe wonky to americans but i think maybe because i got an australian wife so i can kind of connect with this shit i say it, it's a very australian kind of album lots of you know always and and, and rowdiness to it, and it's like a drinking album. The only thing I say about that, I, and I actually think the songs are a little bit stronger than they are in Flick of the Switch. Like stuff like uh, Sync, you know, the Pink and stuff, they're a little more thought out. There's a little more finger tapping. Angus's solos, I think these are some of his greatest solos ever. They're very, very strong. They're kind of similar to his solos, I think, on Let There Be Rock, where they're both very heavy and frantic, but yet very melodic. And like if you listen to the solos, they're really amazing solos, and I, it's amazing stuff. And the only negative I say about this album is uh, the second side's not quite as good as the first side. And agreed, agreed. It's a little like the, I say the Gene Simmons school of songwriting, where they repeat the choruses too much. Uh, they just kind of go on and on, especially Hell and uh, High Water and Shake Your Foundations. I feel like they could cut a chorus, and those songs would be a little bit stronger. They'd be a little tighter, but. I, know, I love the vibe of the album. It's kind of the last full-fledged, heavy ACDC album. Yep. And it's, you know, and you just you just crank it on. You just want to fucking, you know, get down to it. I fucking love this album. One, one last thing I want to say about Fly on the Wall. It's funny, the title track. Uh, the intro, the little guitar sound, like in the beginning, the da 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 It's kind of similar to Shoot the Thrill. And the funny thing is, when I was listening to these, you know, I didn't know that, like, because this is before the internet, you know, it's 1989. So I'm like a complete babe in the woods when it comes to ACDC. Like, I don't know that, like, Shoot to Thrill is like a concert staple. All I know is that it was like one of my favorite songs from Back in Black, and I loved that song. So when I went and saw the Razor's Edge tour, and, you know, the second song, Shoot to Thrill, when they first played that little note, the dun dun I remember thinking to myself as a kid, I remember thinking, is this fly on the wall or shoot to thrill? It's funny now in retrospect, because of course it's not fucking fly on the wall. <laughs> it's going to be shoot to thrill. But at, at the time, I remember thinking that. And then when they went on the shoot to thrill, I remember thinking, oh, awesome. They're playing shoot to thrill. That's one of my favorite songs. Like, I didn't realize it was like everyone's like one of their favorite songs. Mm-hmm. You know, right. so it's, a, it's just funny, like to think back to that, like, ooh, it was to go back in time to when you were so naive and everything was fresh and new. Like, I, I didn't know that everyone loved shoot to thrill. I thought it was just me. <laughs> but yeah, uh-huh. final walls. It's a great album. OK. All right. We'll go to the next one, which is technically not really an album uh Boy, just... i didn't talk about fly on the wall oh i, I thought didn't... you did i'm sorry Go ahead. <laughs> okay he's got to talk about the different drummer <laughs> uh hey i like simon Wright. uh i thought he was a perfect replacement for for phil rudd and i thought he fit in the band great um and yeah like there was a noticeable difference when i first heard fly on the wall like like ralph uh, i saw the video for danger first and I didn't know what to think of the song. I liked the video, but yeah, the song was unusual and kind of slow and like, you know, kind of like meanders along. 
But when you when I heard the whole album and I heard how it fit into the whole context of the album, I love that song. I love it now too. I thought it fit perfectly on side one where it is, and it made sense. But that when I first heard the album, I was like, "Whoa, man! This is like it has like a metal production, very full guitars, uh, and maybe Brian's vocals are a little too reverbed out at, at points. You can't really fully understand what he's saying sometimes, and they're a little bit back in the mix, but." It kind of it kind of worked with the whole production of the album. It's a very wet sounding album, and it has a metal production. I think it's the most metal album they ever put out, and it's the last great ACDC album, and it's the last super heavy ACDC album. And uh, I like the the whole fly on the wall uh, VHS, uh, the, the short play movie, you know, with the with like five songs, and they're all connected. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, had that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. And another mor- morbid reason why I, I'm so into this album is because ACDC was getting a lot of negative press around this time because of the Night Stalker, because like, he, he left an ACDC hat at one of the murder scenes, and that was right during the Fly on the Wall tour. So they were in the press uh, negatively, and that made me like him even more. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, like it was all about Ozzy and ACDC at that time in the news, bad stuff going on around them. And uh, and another less publicized negative thing that happened in the press was another murder that took place in Long Island. A guy named the Acid King, uh, I think his name was a, a Ricky Queso or something. He uh, was a devil worshiper, and he dropped out of high school, and he murdered one of his uh, school school chums in like a pseudo satanic ritual in the forest. And when he got arrested. He was wearing a fly on the wall long sleeves. I was oh, like, yeah. yeah, that's, awesome. <laughs> yeah. that's awesome. So, yeah, it's kind of morbid. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> when the Night Stalker uh, made his way up uh, to Northern California, and he was uh, rumored to be in the Bay Area, and rumored to be in Daly City, actually, at one point. That's the city I grew up in. It's, it's a city that's right next to San Francisco. And I remember uh, me and a bunch of my friends, very stupid thing to do. Like, like they were saying, like, watch out for a white van in your in your neighborhood. Keep an eye out for a beat up white van. So that night, we all got on our skateboards and bikes and and grabbed hammers and meat tenderizers and whatever whatever kind of weapon we could find in our in our homes. And we like just kind of skated around the the neighborhood. And I had my little boombox and I was blasting fly on the wall while we were looking for the night stalker. <laughs> Yeah, maybe he'd come out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, 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 it could have ended re- really badly for all of us. You know? <laughs> no, no, you say you play an ACD, I can't kill you. Yeah, he'll yeah totally, you totally. guys party. I'm part of the brotherhood. <laughs> he'll probably he'll probably go up to you and try to recruit you to go kill people with him. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, that's why I like flying the wall so much. <laughs> yeah, hey, I, I got to ask, uh, Will, also you, Ralph, I, do you, are you familiar with the, the films of uh, James Van Bieber? He did uh, Deadbeat at Dawn. The, yes. Yeah. Well, I, do, I, I'm not familiar with him, but I know Deadbeat at Dawn because my guitar player was really into that real sick type yeah. of fucked up movie. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, I, I don't know this movie. But yeah, he's oh, a really a cool, fucked up movie. Yeah. He's a really cool underground filmmaker. Uh, uh, I'm friends with him. He's a cool dude. And he made that film. I became friends with him on Facebook and we like to talk a lot. And he's just a really cool guy. We like a lot of the same shit. You know, he loves, you know, cool music. He loves Dokken and Pantera. So we, we talk about that a lot. But he made a short film about the Acid King uh, called, uh, inspired by, called uh, My Sweet Satan. I don't know if it's available I online. know that movie too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I think I've seen that. I think yeah, I've that, seen it. He did, yeah, that's a badass film. I think he has a scene where he's wearing like an ACDC shirt. But yeah, it was definitely inspired by that. And he also did a movie about the Manson family too in the early 2000s. So what was yeah, that called? I, it's, it's, uh, so it's, called, the, it's the, called The Manson Family. Oh, I didn't see that one. Yeah, yeah, so, it's cool. Oh, badass film, Ralph. Badass. The, the rumor about that ACDC shirt I've read uh, is that that wasn't even his shirt. When they arrested him, he was wearing whatever, like a flannel or just a regular T-shirt. And then when they were bringing him into the police station and the, all the news was there, they made him put on that ACDC shirt just to make him look even that more oh. evil. That rules, dude! Oh. I mean, like... It's good they probably sold a few more copies because of it. <laughs> what, did, what, did, what did the Bible thumpers call ACDC? It was like Antichrist 
Devil's Child. De- Devil's Child. Devil's Child. Yeah, yeah I remember that was one of the first things I heard. It was still like you know, because um, like you, uh, Raph, you know, my childhood was mainly. I'm originally from Philly, but when I was three, we moved down to Florida. So essentially, most of my childhood was in uh, Florida, and. My uh, so when, my first year of junior high was in Florida too. We moved uh, the following year, but that year I got a little touch of that because when I started talking about ACDC, like how I was getting into them, there were a few friends that said, "Oh, you know that means Antichrist Devil's Child." <laughs> that made me want to get into them even more. It's like awesome. <laughs> also, yeah. also on the Fly on the Wall tour, didn't they bring Night Prowler into the set list mid tour? Uh, they might have, but it wasn't played at the show I saw because I would remember that. So, and I remember ACDC were trying to downplay the whole thing and like say how terrible it is, and they don't want their name being connected to such a horrible person. And then they add Night Prowler yeah. to their set list. Give me a break. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they add a song they never played with Bond. Come yeah. on. <laughs> right, yeah, right. They, I, I saw an interview of them, and they and listen, I love ACDC, but this was definitely bullshit. They were like, oh, well, that song, the lyrics of Night Prowler. If you oh, listen yeah. to it, it's just he's just a peeping Tom. I was like, no, Bullshit. no, you put the fucking knife to her throat. Yeah, you, you put, <laughs> no, it's, you put a knife in the back and the guy in an alleyway. That's what it says in the fucking lyrics. Yeah, it doesn't that, say nothing about scoping on chicks in a window and shit. Yeah, he's got a fucking knife. He's yeah, he's he's up to some nasty business. It's not just a yeah. peeping Tom. But you know, I understand they got they got spinning a little bit. Yeah, but yeah. and Brian's like, hey, I didn't write the song, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't even in the band. I wasn't even in the band, I was you know <laughs> putting windscreens on cars <laughs> at the time. Here's some here's some <laughs> trivia. Wasn't there a name for the fly? Didn't they have a name for that little guy? Uh, not that I remember. I'm sure there was. I I could have sworn I I read an interview where they were calling it calling that fly something. But do you yeah, think there was an attempt like they were trying to have like a mascot that wasn't Angus? Like they were trying to have like an Eddie, but they pick a funny little fly. <laughs> <laughs> like no, guys, that's not what the metalheads want. They don't want to fly. Can you imagine if that fly was on every yeah. album cover from here on out? <laughs> Somewhere <laughs> in fly. <laughs> oh man well the next one is not uh it's not an album that uh, uh it only has a couple new songs who made who um this video was played so much on mtv who made who and looking over these tracks who made who dt and chase the ace are the only new songs on here and, and they're two both of them instrumental. yeah yeah and uh, I don't really think much of this. I mean, you guys like this album? I do. Well, the new songs. I mean, everything else is like, no. I mean, and, you know, what's really cool is that they added Ride On. I like that. Totally. Uh, the, the two instrumentals are, are cool. I mean, you know, I could take or, take or leave them. They're not going to be in my, like, ACDC mixtape or anything like that. But they're cool. But this album has a special uh, place in my heart because this is the first tour I saw ACDC. So... They opened up with the song Who May Who, and a bunch of contest winners uh, came on stage dressed as Angus. So there was like, you know, there was like 30 Anguses on stage or something. So that was kind of fun. And like, just, yeah, this album has a special place in my heart. Um, and I just remember one thing about the show there was, this, there was this little fucking like midget biker guy standing next to me and my brother doing key bumps uh, all night. <laughs> And uh, Queensryche opened, and they were touring for uh, Rage for Order. And this is before I was a Queensryche fan. So um, they look they look kind of weird on that tour. I mean, even though I'm a Queensryche fan now, and Rage for Order is my favorite Queensryche album, but they look terrible on that tour, man. They were just they're all in like trench coats and silver scarves. And, yeah. And their hair was all like done up stupid, and just they look they didn't look cool, you know. But you know, I and I you know I wasn't. I wasn't really familiar with Queensryche at the time, but I still wanted to give him a chance. But this this little midget cokehead biker guy next to me was just screaming, fuck you! <laughs> the, their, their entire set, man. I mean, he, like, he would do a bump and go, fuck you! And then do another bump. And, you know, it was driving me crazy, man. So I couldn't enjoy Queensryche at all. But ACDC was great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that that tour didn't come here. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I got ripped off because I never missed an ACDC tour since uh, 
for those about to rock. Every time they were here, I saw it. But yeah, who made who didn't come to South Florida? Which yeah, didn't he? Uh, well, didn't he? Do, from what I read, anyway, uh, they did a uh, she's got balls on that tour. Didn't yeah. They? Yeah. Totally. Wow. Yeah. What? Totally. Yeah, they did She's Got Boss. And this was also back in the day where it, it, bringing fireworks to a concert was kind of a normal thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I just remember throwing firecrackers in the air and, and like not by the, the, the singular cracker, but by the whole pack, just throwing packs of firecrackers <laughs> in the air throughout the show. So and I have some really fond memories of that night. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, Edwin, what do you think of Who Made Who? Well, uh, it was my first ACDC album that I ever listened to. You know, I borrowed it. And so obviously I have very sentimental, you know, uh, feelings about the album. But uh, objectively listening to it, I, you know, I bought it along with, you know, when I got all their albums like on vinyl a few years back. You know, I got this too. And I mean, yeah, I, Who Made Who? The song's great. I think it's a really clever song, some great lyrics. Uh, a really interesting way to interpret the movie and uh, it's got some great riffage and cool licks from Angus and it's cool. It's like one of their last kind of almost, I would say by ACDC standards, kind of progressive. Like it's a little different. Like this doesn't sound like a song they would have done in the seventies. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little different. And uh, the two instrumentals I love, especially uh, DT. I'm a big DT fan. Always was. I think it's Simon Wright's, Greatest moment. It's just a good groove. I love good that. Point. That's a yeah. good point. I, I, I kind of forgot about his drumming on that song. It, it is good drumming. Totally. It's, yeah, it's got good groove, very powerful. Love the, the guitar. It's fine. I used to, this is how I was always, I guess, I didn't know it was called OCD back in the day, but I guess it was a little OCD even when I was younger. Because when I made uh, mixtapes for friends, like ACDC stuff, uh, or even early on, like in the mid 90s when I like, burned discs. Uh, I would uh, burn like mix, mix. I would always want to have like half Bond, half Brian, and I always used to put DT in the middle of the mix. So it was kind of a kind of changing, like cleansing of the palate. Like you heard one singer, but before we go to the next singer, you got D just an instrumental. Like that's that how is, that, that is very nerdy, <laughs> and I like it. <laughs> yeah, I just, like I said, you know, yeah, I, I, OCD, nerdy, I couldn't help it, but that, I just would get so into it. It's like, oh, I want to segue them into this other singer. So, I don't know, DT's, DT worked as a really good segue. I think it would have been a great song to do live. It'd be something like Angus could do to strip to. It was like, you know, it's a cool song. I really love that song. Uh, and Chase the Ace, good rocker. And, you know, it's interesting because the album is, that's the first time, you know, I heard for those about to rock on an album and it's the closing track like they close every concert with. So I will say this. It was kind of weird. The first time I heard for those about to rock was afterwards. The album. I'm, ex I'm exactly yeah. on the same page with you. Yeah, that, was, was, that was the first time I had heard for those about to rock as yeah. well was on uh, on the soundtrack. Yeah. And it threw me for a loop as a, a, that being the opening track on the actual album. Totally. Yeah. It just sounded like a last song to me. So, yeah. yeah. So I was like, oh, wait. That, that last song's the first song now and obviously over the years i've grown to see how that works as a first song too i mean it could only be a first song or last song that's the only way for those about the rock could work but it was weird for me to hear it as a first song for for many years i didn't get used to it that way totally yeah all right well let's go into the final the final album of the 80s and uh we'll come back next week with the 90s stuff but uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll talk about this last uh, album. Uh, blow up your video. I'll go last oh. this time. I'll I'll throw this one to Will first. Oh guy, I now this was the first ACDC album I felt uh, betrayed or just totally disappointed by. And I think I saw the video for Heat Seeker on Headbangers Ball, like a world premiere, before I got the album, and I hated it. I hated that song. I still do. I think it sucks, man. I don't like just the opening line. Get ready, it's her rock. I'm like, no, like, yeah. no, dude. Like, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, I just don't dig it at all, man. But I, th there are some songs on the album I dig. Uh, uh, I like the last song, uh, "This Means War." Is that yeah. on that album? Yeah. Yes, that's a great song, and that's actually the last fast ACDC song. I don't think they ever made another song that fast. That is a good point. Yeah, well, isn't fire your guns kind of fast though? It's fast, but I, this mean means war, war might be a little faster. Fire okay. guns is a little fast. They're close. Okay. okay. Um. 
yeah, so yeah, I was disappointed with this album big time, and just the, just the whole title of the album, like uh, blow up your video. I just I wasn't into it, man. And uh, but there are some good songs like Kiss and Dynamite's cool. Um, Nick of Time is a very unusual ACDC song. It seemed like they were definitely experimenting more on this album as opposed to Fly on the Wall, which was just trying to like beat you beat you over the head. Uh, and you know, there some of it some of it works and some of it doesn't. Uh, and I saw this tour, and I remember like the, the missile coming out from behind the drum set, and Angus came out of the top, and that was cool. Uh, I remember the T-shirt for Heat Seeker. You ever see the Heat Seeker T-shirt? Uh, was it him coming out of the the thing? They had a T-shirt like that too. Yeah, that's the T-shirt I remember. It, isn't the Heat Seeker? It's him like on a missile or something. Some... No, no, it was pretty offensive shirt, and oh. it, wouldn't, it wouldn't fly these days. It was like. It was like a drawing of a businessman, like the body of a businessman, and but the head, but the head was a missile, a heat-seeking missile, and there was a girl leaning <laughs> over, leaning over the hood of a car with her skirt up, and <laughs> and the heat, the heat, like missile is like like pointing right at, at her crotch. So, <laughs> oh, that's awesome! I can find that. Find on eBay. So oh, I'm sure it goes for a lot, man. You you'll probably find that right right next to the Mistress for Christmas T-shirt. You ever I, see I, that T-shirt? Oh yeah. yes, I have. Yes. I, okay. actually, I actually owned a Miss. That was the. <laughs> so I remember looking at the the Heat Seeker. It was a jersey too, I think, and I, I loved jerseys back then. And I just I just didn't have the balls to bring that shirt home to my mom. Man. <laughs> I wear the Mistress the Christmas shirt like at school. Yeah, time. totally, that, man. That doesn't so, sound quite as dirty as the Heat Seeker one. <laughs> so I ended up buying the uh, the Hell's Bells T-shirt. I think that was the first tour they had a Hell's Bells shirt. They've had it many times since then, but that was also a jersey. It had the bell on the front with the flames and a bunch of demons, like uh, shadows of demons behind the bell. It was a really wicked shirt, so I got that one instead. But uh, yeah, so back to the album. You know, there's a there's a handful of good songs, but it's a pretty weak album overall, I have to say. Uh, Edwin? Uh, I have a lot of mixed feelings about this album. Uh, from a songwriting standpoint, I listen to this album and think, uh, kind of like Who Made Who, I think it, this this is really the last album where they, like you brought up Will with Nick of Time, it's kind of the last album where they're trying different kind of songs. Yeah. They never really did that quite again, for the most part. Uh, so it's like the last time, like Nick of Time does not sound like anything they would have done, like even like just a few years prior, let alone like the 70s. So they're trying a few different things. It definitely sounds late 80s. Uh, mm -hmm. And like it sounds like they're they're trying to be smart. I think the lyrics are better than they were on Fly on the Wall. Mm -hmm. uh, lyrically, actually, uh, Some Sin for Nothing, like those are really clever lyrics, actually, if you listen to them, uh, almost a little Bon Scott-esque at times, a lot of wordplay. I think they're some of Brian's best lyrics. And and the last time he wrote lyrics is uh, this album. Uh, uh, so oh, really? I think, yeah, it's the last time. Uh, he, huh. uh, after that, the Young Brothers uh, took over full time. I, I think the Young Brothers were always helping him to a degree, like uncredited. But they uh, in the 90s, I think because they wrote Thunderstruck and wanted to get all the royalties from it. <laughs> and so they uh. kind of squeezed out Brian after that. But, but blow up, just a theory of mine. Uh, but... Brian, um, they're interesting lyrics. The songs are interesting, like even Kissing Dynamite. It's almost a little, like the chords are a little jazzy. Like it's a little different. Like they're trying different stuff. My biggest issue with this album is just the production sucks. It's weak sounding. And and there's way, I mean, there was a little bit too much reverb, you know, like on Brian's voice on Fly on a Wall. But now reverb is like drenching this whole fucking album. Yeah, it's totally. Just, it's just, and it takes away the sonic power. They just, it just sounds weak, and and it's, and I think the second side is ironically for ACDC, it's like a little stronger than the first side. The uh, I I think it, it, the songs are a little bit better on the second side, but I think sonically it doesn't have the same impact. If like Flying a Wall was the last real heavy ACDC album, this was like the first lighter ACDC album, and. Yeah. 
it doesn't have the same impact. And it's too bad because I listen to these songs and think, man, if they just kind of had a beefier production and there wasn't so much reverb, I, I feel this would be a strong record. I think the songs are there. I, I could, Heat Seeker, I don't hate it like you will, but it's not one of my favorite songs from the album. Uh, I, I do like, I think uh, This Means War might actually have been a better opener. Uh, oh, it's man, kinda, that would have been brutal if they opened up with that song. Yeah, it's kind of like a heavier more raw thunderstruck you know and i think it could have worked well as an opener and that could have even been a a a cool album title you know uh i feel i i feel it's also interesting because this is one of the few acdc albums that has a lot of like b-sides like there's they normally don't have extra tracks but if you're like uh on the borderline and at snake eyes like there's some good tracks a few of those tracks i think are better than some of the songs that made the album so i've never heard i've never heard any of the b the b song yeah, there's like three songs, which is unusual for ACD. Uh, Borrowed Time also is another one. Yeah, yeah, there's three tracks. They're on the, um, uh, what's that compilation? Backtracks or back something. Backtracks. Like yeah, they're all on backtracks. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, and it's unusual because normally ACDC, they like run a tight ship. Like, like hey, we, we wrote 10 songs and we're recording 10 songs and that's it. You know, uh, for whatever reason, Flow Up Your Video, they, they had a couple songs that didn't make the album and they showed up as B-sides. But So the, these songs were like the B-sides? For that's the way I want my rock and roll and and yeah. seeker. Was yeah. there three singles from the album? Uh, no, one, one actually, Bar Time was laid over. They used it for Money Talks, the single for that. Ah. So, but it was from the blow up uh, sessions. Okay. Uh, but yeah, the Snake Eyes I think was the B side for Heat Seeker, and Bar Time was the other one. The uh, that's the way I like my rock and roll. I actually uh, like that's the way I want my rock and roll. I remember when that that single came out, I was like, okay, this song's a little better. It's but, kind of, uh, it's kind of yeah. Zeppelin-y. I love I do like the riff. It's a very Jimmy Page kind of riff. Mm-hmm. Cool drumming. Uh it's a cool song. I like that they played that and Heat Seeker they played on the Razor's Edge tour. Uh but yeah, it's I but some of these B sides I feel were a little stronger. Like I don't think Go Zone's that good of a song. I feel like Snake mm-hmm. Eyes or the the borderline song would have been better than that. I feel like they, they had something there and then they kind of dropped the ball. Like like I feel there's something there. And I can't hate the album because I, I like the songs and it's kind of the end of an era of ACDC trying different shit. So I kind of respect it. But it does it's definitely not ass kicking the way that all the other albums are. So it is kind of the first A C D C album that doesn't totally kick ass. So did didn't the video for um uh, uh You Shook Me All Night Long come out around this time too? Or was that for <laughs> Who Made Who? Who Made Who? That was for Who Made Who as well? Okay, yeah. 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 Awesome yeah. video. That that chick's really hot. But yeah, yeah that, was, that was a great video. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great fit. And yeah, and it's got Simon on the drums, you know, instead of Phil. Yeah. The, yeah. If I can forgive it because it's a good video. I saw this tour as well, but you're going to have to listen to the 70s ACDC um, episode because I talked about the car accident and uh, all this crazy shit that happened. But I look, I, I don't know, man. I mean, I, I do like Heat Seeker. I like that. It's the way I want my rock and roll. I love This Means War. That's like my favorite off here. Rock. Um, but the rest really just doesn't connect with me. But I put this in par with Flying the Wall for me, man. I just feel like they're both, like, they have some good tracks and mo- a few and the most, ah. Uh, but um, I do own both 45s to this album. I don't know how I ended up with them. But I have Heat Seeker, and that's the way I want my rock and roll on 45. Mm. But anyway, guys, uh, we're coming back next week for the 90s ACDC. So, uh, and I will definitely brush up on my 90s ACDC. Uh, it's been a long time since I've listened to Stiff Upper Lift. I mean, there's only two albums for the 90s, right? Well, shit, Lee. It's shit, shit, Will. I wanted to do it now. <laughs> I, wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to do the facade that we were done for now. Oh, okay. but but if, but but if you want, we can come back next week. Are you good with that, Edwin? Yeah, I can do it if that's how. You, if you want to brush up, it's a uh, it's ball break. It's, there's actually only two albums in the nineties. They weren't she, that productive. No, we'll just then we'll just do the rest of the. Yeah, uh, we'll just do all of them because yeah, yeah if, we'll, after the Razor's Edge, it's pretty much like every five years there's an album. Right, right. All right, guys. So that's the end of the eighties. So next week we're gonna come back for the nineties, two thousands, and. 2000 shit even a 2020 album 
So we're gonna we're gonna because they don't have and, and what is it? It's it's just as many albums, right? It's probably. <laughs> let me well, real fast. I'll do it in my head. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's, it's six albums. And and we just talked about six albums, right? Was it? Yeah, more or less. Yeah. Uh, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So look, you can't who may do. Yeah. Oh, there you go. So next week we'll 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 do the rest of the Brian Johnson discography. So tune in to the Vieira Vault next week. All right, there you go. That is the '80s ACDC. Next week we're doing the '90s all the way to 2020, and I already recorded it. I already edited it, and it'll be up next week. But for this week, before I leave, you know what I gotta do? Play you some rare stuff. And you know it's going to be ACDC, so follow me into the Vieira Vault. All right, we're inside the vault, and I'm going to play you something that's a bootleg, but it's a soundboard. It's from a bootleg called Flies on the Soundboard, which was recorded in Austin, Texas on October 11th, 1985 on the Fly on the Wall tour. And, uh... It sounds amazing, as you will hear right now. Here is ACDC Live in Texas doing Sink the Pink. Yes. Sink the Pink!
Sink the Pink live on the Fly on the Wall tour in Texas. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, starting in a couple weeks, I'm going to start giving shout outs to everybody that share my show, that uh, leave comments and so on. So, you know, because you all deserve it. You all are listening. You're all giving your input on my episodes. And I believe that it's only fair to let you all be part of the Vieira Vault. Especially you that's listening right now. You rule. Everybody rules, including Will and Edwin, who will be back here next week to round off the rest of the discography from Razor's Edge all the way to the last one that I can't remember the title now. Power Up. <laughs> All right, man. Y'all rule. Thank you so much. Stay frosty and smack them a gob.